Today we're continuing our series, but I just want to remind you about something. Jesus has just been baptized. Uh, the Holy Spirit has ascended on him like a dove. God has spoken uh, from heaven. And uh, Jesus leaves the baptism and he goes off into the desert where our text today uh, picks up in chapter 4. So we're in Luke chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you today, uh, Luke chapter 4, we're going to start at verse number 1. Um, and we're going to move slowly through this chapter. So let's look at the first couple of verses. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, that's important, okay? Understand that. We need, to, we need to grasp this. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, we talked uh, uh, a few, I think a couple of, a few weeks ago about how that wilderness was more like a desert, if you remember. Uh, it was more like a desert. It was just a, a barren wasteland, just desert, just hot, and just so here Jesus is, he's out in this wilderness. Verse 2, where for 40 days, this is important, 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Now, verse 1, it, it affirms to us that you can be filled with the Spirit and be afflicted by the devil. Jesus was. Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and he was being afflicted by the devil. And we also know from verse uh, 2 that Jesus' temptation by the devil was not just a one-time event, boom, 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 and it's over. For 40 days, as he's out in the desert, Jesus is being tempted constantly by Satan. Now, we, don't, we know there's three events, there's three specific events, and we'll get to those in just a moment. We know there's three specific events that happened in that desert experience, and we just don't know how long each experience lasted. We don't know if it was just one time and then Satan left for a minute and came back or what. The way I understand it, and from my uh, understanding, reading Scripture here, verse 2 says, for 40 days Jesus was tempted. So I believe that it was a constant non-stop time when Satan is bringing out these three things uh, uh, to him. So, and it doesn't go into detail how long each of these temptations took. So, uh, have any of you ever fasted food for a long period of time? Anybody ever done a, uh, a two-day fast or a three-day fast or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, so if you've ever done anything long, I think the best I've ever done is two days. I, I might have done three. I can't remember. Uh, can I just tell you, I'm not a good faster. Um, I'm planning, I'm starting to plan now that when I get done with school, I'm planning on some sort of fast. I don't know how long I'm going to do it for. I don't know. I haven't decided all that, but I'm still and do the fast that I believe that God wants me to do. So I'm preparing myself now mentally to do some sort of fast. I don't know how long it will be. I don't know how long I will I will do this fast, but I'm preparing myself for this. But if you've ever uh, fasted for ever for a long period of time, the uh, you you will know that your body almost immediately when you decide to fast starts craving food. It's it's like a mental thing that you say I'm going to fast today, and all of a sudden, what happens? Yeah, stomach growls. You're, I mean, you're talking every temptation in the world is being thrown at you. Your favorite food will probably be advertised on a TV program. I mean, you're probably going to see every kind of temptation possible. And they say that the first three days are the hardest because those are the days that you are the hungriest. And they say that day two is the worst because ghrelin, G-H-R-E-L-I-N, the hormone that signals you are hungry, is peaking on day number two. So we know that it is possible to fast for 40 days. People have gone longer on hunger strikes uh, than 40 days, but it is during this time that Jesus is tempted by the devil and Jesus comes out of the baptism. He's on a spiritual high. He's full of the Holy Spirit and God has spoken and claimed that Jesus 
is the chosen one. Now, let me say this. Do you know that every time that God gives you a blessing, the devil wants to rob you of your blessing? Do you know that? Every time that God gives you a blessing, he gives you something great, something grand that's happened. Satan wants to come, and he wants to rob you of that blessing. Let me show you. Think about this. The children of Israel, they're coming out of Egypt. They're being set free from bondage. They're no longer slaves to Egypt because here it is. Moses is bringing them out. And what happens as they are leaving Egypt? Pharaoh and his army decides to come and rob them of that blessing. He does not want them to leave. So then also the, uh, 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 in the New Testament, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples are there. They're having this wonderful moment. I mean, you know, with, they're there with the saints and, and, and Jesus, and this is just a, a spiritual high. I mean, they are just coming off that mountain. They come down the, down the mountain. You know what happens? A demon-possessed boy comes up to them and starts saying that they can't, you can't cast out demons. You know, you, you can't do it. You can't make any miracles. You can't do There's You have no authority. And it, they, these demons question their authority. Any time that you receive a spiritual blessing, Satan wants to steal that spiritual blessing. Now, when you are in the will of heaven, you become a target. Amen? When you are in God's will, when you are in God's perfect will, you become a target. And following the God's will is not always easy, right? It's not easy. And staying in the will of God, it can be even harder. Because the more you are in God's will, guess what? The more the enemy is wanting to attack because he doesn't want you to accomplish the things that God wants you to accomplish. And so many people, when it gets a little hard, they're going to run and they're not going to stay to see what God has for them on the other side of the breakthrough. You've got to stay and main and stay and continue to focus on what God has for you in the moment that God has for you because when you come through that breakthrough, you're going to come through to the other side and then God was going to lift you up so that you can be refreshed and renewed and ready to go fulfill the victory that he has for you. Amen? So Jesus just had a blessed moment at his baptism, and now as he goes into the desert to get alone with God so he can start his ministry, and what happens? The devil comes after him and uh, attacks him, uh, uh, brings temptations upon him. Now, there are three reasons that Jews would fast. Real quickly. Uh, number one, mourning for the dead. Someone in their family would die, and they would fast in their mourning. That was, that was part of it. Number two, as an act of repentance. Uh, they, would, they would fast and it would uh, afflict or cause pain to their soul, okay? Then number three was dependence in prayer as a way to show that you are depending on God to supply your need. You're getting, rent, you're getting rid of food and you're relying on God to bring you nourishment during this time. Now, let me just say this. Fasting is not a spiritual diet, hmm. okay? Uh, uh, it is not a way to twist God's arm in order to get what you want. That's not what fasting is. Uh, it is a way to tune out the flesh, to deny yourself that food, and to say yes to God and allow God, and allow God to bring you the nourishment that you need and the things that you need. That's what fasting is. So Acts 13 is a perfect example of this. A group of people were meeting in Antioch. They were praying and fasting. And the Holy Spirit spoke to them, probably through a message in tongues and interpretation, and told them to set apart of uh, Paul and Barnabas for the word of God, uh, for the word that God had for them to do. There was something that God wanted them to do. That's when they were starting to go uh, on their missionary journeys. But these are the three types of fasting that is done. Jesus was using fasting as a way to prepare himself for his ministry. Uh, and it's during this time that the devil will use three things to tempt Jesus with. And so we're going to begin, uh, look, let's look at them uh, beginning at verse 3. The first temptation that Jesus comments about is a temptation uh, for food. Luke chapter 4 verse 3 says, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. 
Now, I believe that this temptation came during the, those first few days. And I, I don't have any proof. I don't have any way. But the body, that's the first few days is when you are at your hungriest, your most vulnerable because you just began this fast. And so I believe what better way to tempt somebody than to bring them and say, hey, you know, I mean, he is the son of God. Satan knows who he is. He understands who he is. It's not like he just met Jesus for the first time. You know, he knows who he is. And he's like, hey, why don't you take this stone and turn it into some bread? And let's just get this misery over with. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to starve anymore. Uh, and, uh, and so I truly believe this happened within the first few days. And what a way to start, right? What a way to start this fast. Because <laughs> here you are, you're out there, you're beginning this fast, and here comes someone and is offering you food. In this temptation, what Satan is doing is he's questioning God's provision. That's what Satan's doing. God is our provider, amen? God can provide everything that we need, amen? He owns it all, he has it all, and he can give it to us, and, he, and we can take it, and we can go and be who God wants us to be. And so what Satan is doing is he's questioning God's provision. And that word if here, uh, if you look right there, it says if you are the son of God, that word there uh, is translated since. So it can, you could put since you are the Son of God. Satan knew that Jesus was the Son of God. Satan knew what Jesus was about to do. He knew that he was fixing to start his ministry. Uh, so he is trying to get Jesus uh, to use his power to take care of his hunger. And ironically, this is the same type of temptation that Satan used in the Garden of Eden. Uh, if you will just eat of this fruit, your mind will be open to a whole new world. You won't need to depend on God for anything. That's what Satan was doing in the Garden of Eden when he was tempting Adam and Eve. If you'll just eat this fruit, you're, you, you'll be like God. If you'll just eat this fruit, then you'll, you'll, God's trying to hide stuff from you. And if you'll just eat this fruit, then you'll see everything. It's also the same type of temptation that Sarah used um, that's that, uh, that Satan used on Adam or Abram and Sarah. God was going to build a great nation through Abraham, but Sarah was old and they didn't have any children. So Sarah says, take my maidservant and we'll just get this thing rolling, right? I mean, we'll just get it started and we will just help God out, right? She was getting ahead of God and saying, we don't need God to make this happen. And so God, let me just say this, God don't need your help to fulfill his will. Amen? We got to be patient, and everything will come together in his timing. Amen? In his timing. We just got to be patient and wait for God in his timing to do some amazing things that God wants to do. So Jesus goes to the word to combat the enemy, and he says in verse 4, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The second temptation is temptation of high places. Look at verse 5. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Now, when we think of mountains here in the United States, what's the first mountain range that you think of? Now, I know if you're from Arkansas, you may be thinking of magazine, but can I just tell you, magazine's not very big. It's only about 2,700 uh, feet elevation. Mountains in the United States, it's the great Rocky Mountains, right? I mean, you're talking in some areas, they're up to 20,000 feet. I mean, these, these things are massive. If you've ever been to Colorado or, or Mexico, I mean, New Mexico or, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nevada, I mean, any of those areas, it's just, I mean, absolutely beautiful. Utah, uh, Wyoming, we go all the way up to Alaska, California. I mean, there's the, the Rocky Mountains is just a massive area. Now, this is not, this high peak here is not that big. Um the region that Jesus was in, the highest peak there was about only 1,200 feet. So it's, it's smaller than Mount Magazine. And Satan takes Jesus to this high place and he tells him, 
that he will give him everything that he sees. And Satan is telling him, you're going to rule over everything someday anyway, so let's just forget all that suffering that you're going to have to go through, and let's just jump to the finish line, right? You're getting it all anyway, so you know, let's, let's just skip ahead and you know, let's forget the suffering. Satan, what he is doing is he's questioning God's promise. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 6 and 8, God says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. So everything is Jesus's. God's already promised it to him. He rules over everything, and Satan is telling him, let's just speed this process up. Let's forget what God's promise is, and Satan is tempting him to get, get it the easy way. Let's just skip going to the cross. Let's forget about salvation. Let's forget about you dying on a cross. Let's forget about all that thing, and let's just get to the point where you just have it all anyway. But Jesus tells him in verse 8, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus is pretty good, right? I mean, he's combating the enemy. He's combating Satan with Scripture. There's no easy way, right? Life is not easy. There's only God's way. And it may not be the easy way, but it's the only way, amen? God's way is the only way. And Jesus had to go to the cross because there had to be a sacrifice for the redemption of sin. It had to be done. It had to be done so that you and I could have eternal life. The third temptation is what, I, what I've labeled the temptation of falling down. Luke chapter 4, verse 9 says, The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So this time, what Satan is doing is he is questioning God's protection. And Satan thinks that he is getting wiser this time because he uses Scripture to try and make the point. But see, the problem is he takes the scripture out of context. And let me just say something here. You can prove anything that you want with the Bible when you take it out of context. You can. The problem is it don't work that way. I can tell you anything in this world can be okay, and I can give you a scripture to show you that it's okay, but it doesn't mean that I'm telling you the truth and I'm telling you it the right way. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? People do it all the time. We see them in the media. They will take a scripture. They'll say, well, the Bible says blah, 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 X, Y, Z, to make their point. Uh, then there's, you ever had those, uh, you remember those false leaders? Like David Koresh and Charles Manson and uh, what was the, was it Jim Jones that uh, had the mass Kool-Aid suicide? You remember, so all these guys, you know what they did? They used scripture to manipulate people into following them into doing what they wanted them to do. They manipulated Scripture to make it sound good, but they manipulated it in the way that it benefited them. People do it all the time. You can't take Scripture out of context. You can't make it say what you want it to say. There's only one way that it's supposed to say it, and that's the way that God had it to say it. Amen? We need God's Word in our life, moving in our life, working in our life, and we need to understand what God has for us, and we can only find it in Scripture, and we cannot take it out of context, but we have to let it be applied to our life. So he's basically telling Jesus to do something incredible to prove that God will protect you. Satan has done everything he can to question everything about God, He's tried to question his provision. He's tried to uh, question his promise, his protection. But Jesus isn't buying any of it. And this is what Jesus said in Luke, or in Luke chapter 4, verse 12. He says, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
And with that final scripture, Jesus wins. He had to endure this for 40 days in the hot desert. So he's hungry. <laughs> he's been in battles. He's fighting. He's struggling. And this is Jesus. He understands what we go through. He understands everything that we face. He understands everything that we're feeling. And verse 13 says, When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Satan ended the temptations for now until next time. Now, you know what we do? We test God all the time, don't we? What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean I test God? How do I test God? When we're out driving over the speed limit, y'all know what I'm talking about? Oh, Lord, please don't let that cop see me. Am I the only one that's done that before? Or what about when we go into a bar? Lord, I won't drink. How about the best way for you to fight off any temptation is just not put yourself in a situation where you might fall, where you might fail, right? Just stay out of that situation. If you have a drinking problem, then don't drive the street with a liquor store on every corner, right? If you have a problem with pornography, don't watch TV or get on the Internet without some kind of device that will block those sites, amen? If you always spend too much money, then don't get a credit card. Amen? The best way to just not be tempted is to not put yourself in situations that we shouldn't have put ourselves into in the first place. Amen? And how do you fight temptation? Number one, you got to stand your ground. James 4, 7 says what? Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then here's the second one. I think it's more important than anything. You've got to study your Bible. If you don't know God's word, how can you defeat the enemy? If you don't know scripture, how can you defeat the enemy? If you haven't memorized scripture or tried to put it in your heart or had it in places that you can see it, how can you defeat the enemy? When a crisis comes up, when something comes up in your life and you don't know how to handle it, and if you don't know Scripture, how can you not go and speak something? You have to go find the Word of God. You have to go look it up. You may not have time to do all that. You need to have God's Word in your heart so when the enemy comes in against you, you can use that Scripture, you can stand your ground, and you can say, listen, Get thee behind me, Satan. You have no authority here. You have no business being here. You can start quoting scriptures to him, and whatever your situation is, you can say, I'm more than a conqueror. I can overcome anything. You know, and you let him know that he is the enemy, and he has to go. He has to flee. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But we've got to study scripture and know it. You will never know the power of God until you know the scriptures. You hear me? You will never understand the power of God until you know the scriptures. And every scripture that Jesus uses, I don't know if you noticed this, but it's from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy took place while the children of Israel is in the, in the, in the wilderness. And these temptations are while Jesus is in the wilderness, right? The children of Israel failed while in the wilderness, but Jesus succeeded in the wilderness. So I want to tell you, if you have a wilderness experience, you can make it out. You can get out of the wilderness. You ain't got to stay in the wilderness. You ain't got to stay in the desert. You can get out. But you're going to need to follow God's leading in order to get out. And the only way that comes through, uh, is through reading and knowing the scriptures that God has for us You've got to study the Word. Amen? You've got to study the Word. Why do you think that we're doing this series, going verse by verse, and, and looking at the Word of God? I want you to know the Word of God. I want you to study it. But I don't want 
Sunday morning to be the only time that you're reading God's Word. I want you to read it before you come in here so you know what I'm going to talk about before I talk about it. Amen? We need God's Word in our life. Look at verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. <coughs> Excuse me. So sorry. So Jesus comes out of the desert. Again, he's in the power of the Spirit. So he goes into the desert. The Holy Spirit's on him, right? He comes out of the desert. What else? The Holy Spirit's still on him. Amen. He made it through that wilderness experience. Did you notice? He had the Spirit when he went in. He had the Spirit when he went out. So what does that tell me? The Spirit helped him get through it. Amen? We've got to have the Holy Spirit as a part of our life. We cannot go without it. Again, our uh, news is spreading fast. He goes into the synagogues where he teaches, and everyone's praising him. So why do you think Galilee? Well, Galilee, Gal Galilee, Galilee was a region, because uh, Jesus was from Nazareth, so Galilee was where Nazareth was in. Galilee was a kind of like, I, when I'm reading this and I, I'm looking at it, I, I view it as Galilee was kind of like a state. Like, you know, you would understand that, being from the United States. It was kind of like a state, and then you had all these little towns and cities in Galilee. The population of Galilee back then was about 3 million people in that area. So it was, it was about the size of Arkansas, I guess. There's about 3 million people in Arkansas, I think. Um, and so you got Galilee is the area around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and during this time, the population, I already told you, uh, so when you look at the Bible names, you will see there are four names that can be mentioned when mentioning the Sea of Galilee. You've probably seen some of these, heard some of these. So Galilee is one. You've heard the Sea of Galilee. The Lake of Gennesaret, maybe you've heard that one. Um, in the Old Testament, it is, re excuse me, it is referred to as Sea of Chinnereth, C-H-I-N-N-E-R-E-T-H. Or the Sea of Tiberias. So if you've ever heard any of those, this is the same uh, body of water that it's referring to. So why Galilee? Well, here's why. Isaiah chapter 9 tells us that God will honor Galilee of the nations. Then it says that for to us a child is born, a son is given. So the Messiah was coming out of Galilee. Galilee was a place where Gentiles lived. It was a region that had a large population of Gentiles. And I don't know if you know this or if you've ever heard me say this, but the Jews did not care too much for the Gentiles. They didn't believe that they were uh, on the same level that they were. Um, they weren't any good in their minds. And then Jerusalem snubbed Galileans. They would make fun of them because they had an accent. Now, does anyone here know what that is like to be made fun of because you have an accent. No? I'm the only one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We get made fun of all the time. The, Gal the, Na the, the Galileans were made fun of. Well, you look at them Galileans, you know. They're a bunch of hicks. That's basically what it was. People look at Arkansas all the time and say, them a bunch of hicks, you know. Um, and maybe you remember when Peter is denying Jesus. Uh, one of them, one of the people that recognized him by his accent, the girl told him, your speech betrays you. In other words, she knew where he was from by his speech. So this is the area that Jesus is from, and this is what people think about uh, the people from where Jesus is from. And also Nathaniel, if you remember um, when he's uh, first hearing about Jesus, he makes a comment, uh, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, that is the way they felt about this area. That is the way they felt about uh, these people. So, and then also, did you notice synagogue? 
I don't know if you've ever noticed this or, or not, but in the Old Testament, they never talked about synagogues. It's always about the temple, right? You always hear them talking about the temple. But if you, um, if you look in the New Testament, all of a sudden you're hearing them talk about synagogues, right? They went to the synagogue. They, they were in the synagogue. They, as they normally did, they went to the synagogue. So when the Israelites were taken into captivity and the temple was destroyed, they couldn't make sacrifices anymore. They couldn't make, uh, or they, uh, they could only study the written law. And they wanted to continue to study the law so they would begin having little meetings uh, to talk about scriptures. And so the synagogue is started. So when they uh, come back out of captivity and they rebuild the temple, they wanted to keep the synagogue and every city would have a synagogue facing uh, the temple. Look at verse 16. It says, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Now, let me ask you this, and I know all of you, it's kind of a question that I'm asking everybody that's here, but I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think church is important? I truly believe that church is important. And if you don't, if you don't, then think again. And here's why. Jesus took time out of his schedule and he had a custom of going to church. We would say we, we're going to church, right? They would say we're going to synagogue. It was very similar, very similar, same thing. And every Sunday, Jesus, every Sabbath, Jesus went to church. If you, if you want to be like Jesus, then you need to go to church every Sunday, amen, that you can. I understand sometimes there's work and there's other things that you can get, but if you've got a chance to go, you need to be in God's house. And, it, and here's the sad thing. It's sad that more people today don't want to go to church. 92% of people claim to be believers, but only 37% will go to church on Sunday. Isn't that crazy? 92% of people claim to be believers. When I say they claim, they say, well, yeah, I, I'm, you know, some people will say, uh, uh, I've been baptized. That's not the same. Some people will say that, yeah, sure, I believe in God. Sure, I believe, you know, I believe in Jesus. But they choose not to ever step foot in the through the doors of a church. Only 37% go to church on Sunday. And you need to go to church, amen? You need to follow in Jesus' footsteps. And go to church. And then, and, then, and then Jesus reads the scripture. Now this is very important. And this is something very that we need to look at and understand. So look at this with me. Verse 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. This is Jesus reading this. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that's what he reads. Then look at verse 20. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today... This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. I can see, I can see this happening. They turn to one another. I can imagine this. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. And this is important. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of, of Sidon. She was a Gentile, okay? Verse 27, And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, 
only Naaman the Syrian. Again, he's a Gentile, Naaman is. Verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. This is his hometown. These are the people that he grew up with. They knew who he was. They made the comment, hey, isn't this Joseph's son? They understood his family. And on this particular day, I don't know about you, I don't believe in coincidences, especially when it comes to the word of God, but Jesus decides to create a stir in church, and he does it on the day that they're reading this passage. That was their normal activity. In the synagogue, they would come in and they would read scriptures every single day. It was, it was a continual thing. That was part of their service. That was their service. And then somebody would you know, talk or whatever. And so Jesus just happened to go into the synagogue on the day that they read this passage out of, I, I believe it's Isaiah, yeah, Isaiah 61, just happens to show up at church on the day. And everyone there knew that this was a messianic mess passage. So when Jesus reads this passage, and then when he says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, he has told them that he is the Messiah. It's basically him, instead of just coming out and saying, hey guys, I'm the Messiah, he did it through this reading. He read the passage, and then he said, today that scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, what you're hearing me say, I'm telling you right now, that's me. And these people start talking to themselves. Some of them might have even said, who does this guy think he is? I mean, we know him, we've heard of him, we know he's Joseph's son. We've seen him play, we've seen him out there working with his father at different times. You know, they understood who he was, but they're not thinking anything about him being the Messiah, the chosen one. And then Jesus takes it a step further, and he really gets them going because in verses 25 through 27, Jesus is mentioning three groups of people that the Jews thought were beneath them. They were all a part of the lowest rung of society. Women were beneath the men and did not hold a place of any authority. Gentiles were not the chosen people of God, and lepers were considered unclean people, and they couldn't be touched. And this infuriates the people. He has set them on fire. I mean, they are just angry at him now. They're so angry that they are ready to take him to the top of the hill and throw him down and kill him. The people of his town have had enough. Isn't it amazing how people think of him as great one moment and then in an instant turn on him? And this won't be the only time. How dare he call himself the Messiah? And then not only did he call himself the Messiah, but look what else he did. He has the gall to tell us about Elijah, how Elijah could have ministered to any widow, but yet he chose to go minister to a Gentile widow. Then he tells us, oh, how Elisha could have ministered to any leper, but he chooses a Gentile leper. Three things that they couldn't stand more than anything. And how dare he say that they have a place that's worthy enough to be ministered to. You know, August, Augustine of Hippo said this. They love the truth when it enlightens them, but they hate the truth when it accuses them. Think about that. I like to say it this way, the truth hurts, right? Jesus is speaking truth to those here, and they don't want to hear it. And I want to close with looking at those last two verses again. It says, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. They were mad, don't you think? 
Have you ever been mad enough that you wanted to take somebody to the top of the cliff and throw them off the cliff? These people were furious. They were angry. And it was a mob of people. And here's the interesting part. If you look up on maps and stuff, the point that they were getting ready to throw Jesus off of is the point that overlooks what will become known as Armageddon. And I, Jesus is standing there, and this scripture doesn't say this, but can you imagine with me for just a moment? He's looking over this valley, and he's probably he's possibly remembering all the things that happened there in the past, what the Israelites did. And he's also looking possibly into the future and thinking about what is to come someday at the Battle of Armageddon. All the events of the past and the future in one place. Can I just tell you this morning as I'm closing? God has a plan for your life. God's plan is the perfect plan. It may not go the way we want it to go. The events may not happen in the order that we want them to happen. We may not fully understand everything that happens in our life. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God has a plan for your life. And if you're struggling, and if you're trying to figure out what your next move is, what your next step is, what your what your next hoorah is, or whatever, I want you to know that if you will put your trust in God's word, and you will study and read his word, then I promise you that God will lay out the plan for you, and you can just open up and receive that plan that God has for you. But we have to submit to his will and follow his leading to the place that he has in store for us. And I also want you to know you need to be aware of the temptations of Satan. Because it won't be an easy road. It never is, is it? When you're trying to follow God's will, when you're trying to follow God's road, when you're trying to go the path that God wants you to, there's going to be so many obstacles that get in your way. We, we like to use the word distractions, right? There's so many distractions that get in your way. I, I, I struggle with uh, my attention span. Anybody else here struggle with that? I fully understand. I'll, I'll be going down a path, or let's just say I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm working on a task, and something will pop up. You ever, you ever have those email alerts that pop up? And I'll go, oh, I need to check on that. I'll look at it, and then two hours later, I'm, on a, I'm so far off my track, and I'm like, wait, wait a second. I got to get back on task here. <laughs> Rabbit trails. You know what I'm talking about? Little bunny trail. You you know, you, you're on, going one path and all of a sudden, ooh, this looks kind of pretty over here. Ooh, this looks pretty. We went to um, Disney a few years back and there's a show, um, uh, The Dog and Max. No, no. What's the um, up, the the balloon? What's the dog's name? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Huh? Doug. Doug. Yes. And uh, on, he's on the stage, and, and they're doing a little stage thing, and, and he comes through, and he's like, you know, acting like a dog, and all of a sudden he goes, squirrel. And then he goes back to what he's doing. My life is a constant going about my life, and all of a sudden, squirrel. Uh, and so we are like that on our journey that God has for us. Are we not? We're going along on our journey, and everything is going grand and great, and we're walking the path that we think we're supposed to be going on, and all of a sudden, squirrel, and we get distracted, right? We have distractions that come, and can I tell you that there's going to be distractions that's going to come to try to get you off the path that God has for you. They're going to happen, and sometimes they come in forms of temptations, and those temptations are going to be those distractions that try to get you off the path that God has for you because it may get hard, it may get rough, 
It may get long. It may get wearisome. And you don't understand why you have to be doing this. And you think, well, I'll just take this distraction and go a different direction. Let me tell you, don't get off the path you're on because God has a plan. You may not understand it. You may not know what's happening, what's going to go on, or what's going to happen next. But I'm here to tell you, if you will just keep staying on that path, God will get you to the place where you need to come. You're going to come to the other side of a breakthrough, and it's going to be so awesome and so magnificent and so wonderful that you'll never even understood or never even thought that it could be that wonderful. Don't get off the path. Don't let distractions deter you. Jesus stayed on the path that he was on because we're going to find out here in a few chapters of what his mission was. And we need him to accomplish his mission. Amen? We need him to fulfill the promise that God laid out for him. And he doesn't let those distractions get in his way. He doesn't let Satan deter him. You say, well, yeah, but he's God. You forget he's also 100% man. He understood and he felt everything that you feel. The only difference between you and I, him and him, him and me, and you and I, or him, him and you and I, you get what I'm going, right? The only difference is he never sinned. We have all sinned. He still understood everything that you were going through, and he fulfills the destiny. He's going to fulfill the destiny that God had laid out for him. So don't let distractions get in your way.